This evening we continue in our study of the fourfold gospel. We're uh, tonight going into lesson 26. The subject matter that is Jesus sets out from Judea for Galilee. And then there's a little subsection that uh, partly what the emphasis on this evening in this lesson will be reasons why Jesus uh, returned uh, back to Galilee. In our previous lessons, we've been looking at Jesus uh, going down to His first Passover uh, after His baptism. And of course, it was there that He cleansed uh, the temple and drove uh, out the animals and overturned the money changers, confronted the religious leaders, had His discussion with Nicodemus. And after the Passover, He was in uh, the area of Judea where both He and John and their disciples were preaching about the kingdom of heaven, the call to repentance and to prepare for the kingdom of heaven, uh, and they were there baptizing him. We were talking about that last week. Tonight, uh, is, is we're bouncing around through several different uh, places. In the past, we've kind of just uh, a lot of times been at one book, but if you look here, uh, you'll see that we're going to be covering areas in Matthew 4 and verse 12, Mark 1, 14, Luke 3, 19, and 20, John 4, 1 through 4. Uh, and so uh, it helps us in this study tonight to understand some of the events that took place that prompted uh, Jesus to return back to Galilee and begin uh, what is referred to as His Galilean ministry. And so tonight as we uh, enter into section 26, that's XXVI, uh, we're going to be looking there. Uh, we're going to start in Luke the third chapter verses 19 and 20 and then we'll uh, move on uh, from there. In our last lesson, again, John the Baptist, Jesus, their disciples were preaching and teaching uh, about repentance. In verse 19 it says, But Herod the Tetrarch, uh, we're told, being reproved by him, that is John the Baptist, for Rhodius, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this also to them all that he shut up John in prison. And so that gives us some uh, thoughts about the events and circumstances that were taking place at that time. Jesus and John were baptizing. Jesus had caused a stir with some of the religious leaders by the events and, and things that happened in Jerusalem. And of course, He was uh, making disciples. And John the Baptist was making disciples. And so one of the things that we uh, see is that, uh, and we find in other places, we have, uh, for those who want to go into to more detail, there is a, a note here about the things that Herod had done. Uh, but we know that the principal thing that John the Baptist was preaching uh, against was the fact that he had his brother's wife. And so uh, it was in an adulterous relationship with his brother's wife, and he uh, was, just as he had been with many others, uh, preaching repentance. And so if you're living in adultery and you're going to be preparing the way of the Lord, uh, you need to tell people to repent. Living in adultery... Uh, living in fornication uh, is not the way to prepare for the coming of the kingdom. Such things will not be tolerated in the body of Christ and in the kingdom. So uh, it didn't make any difference to John the Baptist if he was preaching uh, to a farmer uh, out in the country that come to hear him. Uh, 
or whether he was preaching to the Pharisees and scribes and many of the religious leaders uh, to repent. And he called them vipers, a generation uh, of vipers, warning them to flee from the wrath which was to come. And so all the way up to the king, uh, Herod the Tetrarch, one of those who was ruling over the area. And so uh, because of this, uh, and because he was a thorn in Herod's side, so to speak, Herod had him arrested and had him put into prison. Had him shut up uh, in prison. Uh, and so when this event takes place, a lot of times when we're reading through the, the Scriptures, we don't always connect all the dots. And so this study helps us to understand uh, John and Jesus were preaching and teaching repentance for the remission of sins. John confronted Herod about repenting. Uh, it was not lawful that he should have his brother's wife and so, uh, as he was proclaiming such things, uh, John was shut up in prison. And then when we look in uh, what uh, is Mark, the first chapter there, it says, Now after John was delivered up, uh, when he, that is Jesus, heard uh, that John was delivered up, uh, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, though Jesus Himself baptized not but His disciples, He left Judea and departed again unto Galilee. And so we're, we're taking pieces here. As you can see, if you've got your workbook, we're taking pieces from uh, Matthew, Mark, uh, John, uh, and putting them all together. And so uh, when Herod had John imprisoned, and Jesus knew of that, and He also come to know and to understand that the Pharisees had come to know that He was making and baptizing more disciples than John, Jesus knew that if you can lock up John the Baptist, you can lock up Jesus of Nazareth. And that it wasn't His time. One of the things that Jesus keeps saying over and over is, My hour has not yet come. Now John the Baptist's hour is approaching. His final hour and, and His work is coming to a close. Uh, but seeing the boldness of Herod to arrest John with as many disciples that he had, uh, Jesus knew that the Pharisees would take note and again, the overturning of the, the money changers' tables and the things that He did in Jerusalem. And now He is uh, bringing up or uh, acquiring uh, more disciples than John, so they are threatened by what uh, Jesus is doing. And so when Jesus hears both about John the Baptist as well as it comes to his attention that the Pharisees were aware of that, uh, then he is uh, pretty much left with no options other uh, than either put himself in a situation where uh, he could be arrested and continue the way that he is, or he can, uh, in essence, retreat uh, back into Galilee, uh, move away. The Pharisees, the religious leaders there in Jerusalem uh, did not have quite as a stranglehold, if you will, uh, on the area of Galilee as they had on Judea and especially around Jerusalem. And so Jesus just being uh, a short distance from Jerusalem was leaving Himself in a position uh, that they would again conspire against Him. And it, it seems to have started uh, reasonably uh, early in Jesus' ministry. And of course, as we say, he, 
he kind of came into Jerusalem and made a big splash there on his first appearance after starting uh, his ministry. Now, uh, the religious leaders, uh, one of the things that we're going to see and that we can uh, look at, think about, is that uh, the religious leaders were jealous of the fact that Jesus just kind of comes on the scene. We have John the Baptist, and uh, he was the tribe of Levi, and so he comes on the scene, and he starts drawing away all of these disciples, and he was at odds with the Pharisees, calling them to repentance, and again, got himself uh, in some hot water with Herod. Uh, what he did wasn't wrong. I mean, he confronted someone uh, with their sins, but there are consequences. Uh, and this is uh, the way that God chose, uh, and, and this is the way things worked out. Uh, John came preparing the way uh, for Jesus, and he began to draw disciples unto himself. But in the course of time, uh, we have to ask ourselves what would have happened had John and Jesus continued to both preach all the way up till the time that the church was established. And so uh, we can see that there was division between and some, some contentions between John's disciples and the fact that Jesus was drawing disciples after himself. And so John had to decrease. John knew that he had to, I don't know if he really knew he was going to die necessarily, but he did understand that his period or time was rather limited because he would be handing things off to the Messiah. He had to increase as he would decrease. Uh, but if John was still around, there would be those disciples who would cling to John. And so in the course of things, uh, we know that ultimately John will end up being beheaded. And after John uh, is beheaded, then uh, there is no John for people to continue to follow. And so his disciples had to make a choice as to who they would follow, Jesus, uh, or if they would just go back. Does anybody have any, any questions or comments on this, this part? So what we have and, and what is listed here is we have two reasons that are given as to why Jesus left His ministry in Judea and then went back uh, in to Galilee. One was the imprisonment of John the Baptist. That was a triggering event that caused him uh, to consider the events. And then, of course, when the Pharisees found out that he was making more disciples than John, uh, that also uh, triggers a situation where uh, he is in the spotlight. Now that John is in prison, he's kind of off to the side, and eventually, again, he will be beheaded. But now the spotlight, the focus, uh, is on Jesus and his struggle with the Pharisees and the religious leaders. And there's a considerable bit that Brother uh, McGarvey writes about Jesus and his uh, interaction. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, one of the things that uh, is uh, at the very heart and very center of all of this was the jealousy of the religious leaders, the Pharisees. Here's a man who nobody much knew anything about just a few months ago. And he shows up in Jerusalem during Passover 
And now he's got multitudes, really, of people who are coming to be baptized and become disciples. And this man, again, if they're looking into his lineage, and it seems in the course of time, there were a lot of questions I ask. He was a tribe of Judah, and so he, John the Baptist at least was a Levite. He came from the priestly lineage, and so they might be somewhat tolerant, uh, though they considered probably John to be a, a renegade priest because we've seen there's questions over his baptism, why he was baptizing, was the Messiah. Uh, we've looked at some of those uh, situations and circumstances. But he was a priest, uh, and as such, um, you could at least say, well, you know, the priests have responsibility to teach the people to do right. And John's preaching about uh, repentance and those things like uh, many of the uh, prophets of old. And so they may have just kind of, uh, we'll, we'll take and wait and see. But now this man shows up and he's from the tribe of Judah. And as the book of Hebrews tells us, you know, there, there's nothing in the old law about anyone from the tribe of Judah uh, being a priest. And so this sparks jealousies uh, that are going to follow him. Uh, one of the things that uh, Brother McGarvey brings up uh, in Matthew uh, 27 and 18 and, and Matthew 23 and 15 uh, in Matthew uh, 27 and 18 it talks about the fact there that Pilate uh, understood that uh, it was through envy and opposition to the things that Jesus was doing that they had delivered him up uh, we've been looking at the crucifixion on Sunday morning, and of course we're nowhere near the crucifixion, but Brother McGarvey shows the jealousy, the envy. Even Pilate could taste, if you want to put it that way, he could taste the jealousy that the religious leaders had. Um, and we have talked about the fact that one of the things they were concerned about was that if they left him alone, all men were going to follow him, and the Romans would come and take away their place and nation. And you know, some people misunderstand what they're saying. They weren't worried about the nation uh, being wiped out. What they were interested and concerned about was if uh, all of these people were willing to follow one man and do it willingly, then the Romans would enter into a agreement with Jesus and make him head of the people of Israel and take away the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was 70 members, and so they have 70 people ruling over uh, the Holy Land, the nation of Israel, however you want to think about that. And 70 people still, uh, you know, had difficulty keeping the people in line, and this one man could do it. So it's a lot easier to deal with one man than 70. And so Pilate saw that there was some envy, there was some jealousy about uh, what Jesus did. Uh, Jesus in Matthew 23 and 15 talks about at the time uh, the Pharisees. Uh, were very uh, diligent in trying to convert uh, Gentiles to Judaism or to the law of Moses. Jesus talks about the fact that they would compass land and sea to make one proselyte. Uh, you know, I, I kind of think about the fact that you know it's it's like sort of the Mormon Church. If somebody even um, thinks they might be interested. There's a Mormon missionary on uh, their front porch. And I don't know how it is now, but I know years ago, it was really, really when you we went to Salt Lake City, and I, I'll get to the reason for this, but we went to Salt Lake City, we went there to the Mormon Tabernacle and all that, 
and they're, they try and they try and they try every way in the world to get your name, your address, uh, where are you from, you know, what the, it starts out with what state are you in, uh, we'd like you to sign our guest book, and of course the guest book has a place for your name, your address, your telephone number, all that. Would you like a free copy of the Book of Mormon? Fill out this and we'll send you a free. But the whole purpose is to get your name and your address. And if you might be interested, they'll have some of the missionaries come knocking on your door. And the point of that is, is they'll compass land and sea to make one convert. It's that important. Now today, uh, some of the uh, Jewish religious leaders say they disagree with the statement Jesus made because today they, uh, you know, they do not encourage uh, Gentiles to become Jews. And so they read into the fact that today, because the world uh, is at odds with the Jews and the Jews have kind of stopped proselytizing, that they've always been that way, but that's not the case. You know, things change, climates change. You know, in the land of Israel and in that area, they uh, were interested, if someone was interested in Judaism, and they could make a disciple out of them, and they would follow them. Uh, and so we can, we can see the extent they were willing to go to to make uh, one disciple, and that's what Jesus was talking about. So it was very envious they were very envious of the fact that Jesus could stand out in the wilderness and people would come looking for Him. You know, they had to compass, notice what Jesus said, you compass land and sea. They had to go. They had to hunt. They had to go to great extents. That's what's implied. Compass land and sea just to make one proselyte. But Jesus was in the wilderness preaching and multitudes were coming to Him. And so he didn't really, you know, in their eyes, he didn't really have to do anything. He was making disciples and people were following him. And that jealousy that starts here, you know, when the Pharisees learned by their cronies and their spies that Jesus was making more disciples than John. And John had been put in prison. These events happened around the same time. And so Jesus sees that the tide is turning and it's turning you know, too fast because He still has uh, much of His ministry uh, left to deal with before uh, He can be crucified. And so uh, He then uh, prepares to go back through the area uh, uh, out of Judea back to Galilee, and he will spend a great deal of time. I think there, uh, when we break things down, there's about three kind of tours, if you want to call it that, that Jesus makes throughout the country of Galilee. And of course, he will uh, send the 12 apostles out in the limited commission, preaching and teaching uh, in Galilee. And that was not something that. Uh, would have been very good right now in Judea if he'd have sent the 12 out two by two in pairs. Uh, and throughout Judea, it's hard to tell what would have happened at that time. So, uh, as I said, Jesus plans on and prepares to go back to Galilee, and so he can be at a distance from the religious leaders. And one of the interesting things of course, that we see in this is that there is a buffer zone between Galilee and Judea. Uh, and so it wasn't that easy to just travel back and forth. And that buffer zone was what? Samaria. You know, the religious leaders couldn't just pop up and pop down. Uh, you know, in order to get from Jerusalem to Galilee, uh, the, many of them would not go through Samaria, and so it made the trip longer. And one of the things that we see here that Brother McGarvey talks about is, is the people of Galilee didn't seem to have a great deal of problem of coming through Galilee 
and coming down to Jerusalem and then turning around and going back through Samaria to Galilee. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that they made the Samaritans their best friends and buddies, but there wasn't as much problem with the Galileans coming down into Judea and going from Judea back to Galilee as there was religious leaders that were in Jerusalem if for whatever reason they needed to go up into uh, Galilee. And so one of the things that Brother McGarvey gives us here is that if you left Jerusalem going back to Galilee and you go through Samaria, it takes about three days. So it would be a three-day journey from Jerusalem through Samaria and into Galilee. But if you're one of those strict Jews that again thumbs their turns their nose up at you know the Samaritans and sees them as half breeds and unclean and uneducated and following after idols and, and all the other things, then instead of leaving Jerusalem and going through Samaria up to Galilee, what they would do is they would leave Jerusalem and instead of going north, they would go to the east and they would cross the Jordan River and they would go up the eastern side of the Jordan River until they got up above Samaria and then they'd hang a left and come back across the uh, Jordan River into Galilee and then make their, their way to wherever they were headed. And so... Our brother McGarvey says that trip took about seven days. It's four days longer. It took a week to go that way versus three days. And so if the religious leaders were planning on taking a trip or a journey up to check on him, it would be a week up, a week back. So uh, that's it's, it's going to be a piece, uh, plus the journey itself and, and everything and, and hunting him down. and So distance in this particular case uh, worked in a positive way uh, for Jesus. And so his going back uh, into Galilee with Samaria as a buffer uh, sort of was a fence there. It what didn't guarantee that they wouldn't come through it or go around it. Uh, and of course, to some of the uh, rabbis and those who came from Galilee down to Jerusalem, they probably were questioning them and interacting with them and, and trying to keep track of what Jesus was doing later. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it would require uh, that journey back. And so uh, this gives us some insight into and, and kind of pulls everything together uh, in the sense of, of why it was that Jesus left Judea. Uh, he stayed there long enough to uh, build more disciples. And those who were the disciples of John, once he was in prison, uh, you know, they could come looking for Jesus, seeking out Jesus. Uh, in the future, of course, Jesus is going to come back uh, to Jerusalem on at least two other occasions before the third occasion where he ends up being crucified. And so he's going to come back twice and leave uh, in, in the, the coming years. And so those who were the disciples of John, as John was put in prison and then he was beheaded, uh, and, and we see that once John was in prison and he'd been there a while, uh, John sent his disciples when he, he didn't see any great progress as he expected it. He sends his disciples asking Jesus, you know, are you the, really the one that was supposed to come or, or do we need to be looking for another? So we see that John was in prison for a while before he was beheaded. And so it, didn't, it wasn't like he was arrested today and beheaded tomorrow. And, and so there was time there even for him to question. So the disciples were out there and he sent disciples to look for Jesus and ask about it. And so as Jesus comes back, there's an opportunity to engage uh, and to talk about uh, the Messiah and the things that go along with that.
Anybody have any questions or comments on any of that? And of course, John 4 and 4 tells us that uh, he must needs pass through Samaria. I mean, it wasn't mandatory, but it's, it is interesting that Jesus wasn't uh, one of those people who uh, just discriminated. You know, we, he knows that the gospel ultimately will go into all the world. Just because the Samaritans weren't necessarily worshiping as they should have was not a reason for Jesus to discriminate against them. I mean, after all, the uh, Pharisees and the scribes and some of those who were in Jerusalem, were they being faithful either? Not really. You know, Jesus is, is going to, on several occasions, you know, and as we eventually get down to some of these, Jesus will say, you know, they taught for doctrines the commandments of men. And so he meant it to the religious leaders there in Jerusalem. He says, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So the fact that the Samaritans weren't exactly worshiping God uh, the way that they should have maybe uh, didn't really differentiate them that much from the ones who were in Jerusalem because they had uh, created doctrines and teachings that... Uh, we're not a part of the original law either. And we've mentioned that on other occasions, but uh, the, the Jewish leaders refer to that as building fence around the law. And we've talked about that. You know, if, if you have a commandment, then they would create other commandments themselves to keep you from breaking the one commandment. And so uh, it, it become a very uh, strict and we've talked about in, in times past in our lessons, we've talked about the fact that, you know, they, they didn't want you to work on the Sabbath day. And the idea was not to do a lot of manual labor, but they created so many man-made customs, laws, traditions that, you know, if you weren't careful in their eyes, you'd break the Sabbath constantly because their definition of work and God's definition of work was kind of two different things. And so we see that he makes this journey and he starts this journey back to Samaria. And I think that he probably, you know, he knew what he was going to do. He has uh, left Galilee and he came down to Jerusalem and he kind of introduced himself there in the temple and he's been teaching disciples in the wilderness with John the Baptist and so it seems only fitting since he introduced him he's already been introducing himself in Galilee before he came down at the wedding the feast of Cana Galilee and some things there uh, and so he comes down to Jerusalem and introduces himself to those of Judea it only seems fitting then that he would go back up through Samaria and on the way up there would introduce himself there too. You know, since the Samaritans were also looking for and talking about uh, the Messiah's coming, uh, it would probably be expected that he would find a way to introduce himself uh, to the people of Samaria. And that's where we go uh, when we enter into uh, the next section here uh, and start talking about uh, Jesus going through Samaria. So before we start kind of introdu an introduction into that, is there anything else up to that? Okay, in the book it still calls this uh, Lesson 26. Subdivision B, the other one was subdivision A, which give us the reason why Jesus, uh, what sparked him to want to leave Judea and go back to Galilee. Now, as he's going back to Galilee, we have this, uh, might call it a detour. I don't, don't know if it's necessarily a detour, but he's going from Judea back to Galilee, 
And like I say, he's going to have about three tours uh, that he's going to be going through Galilee. But there's this little sidebar, this uh, break. And of course, this uh, is revealed to us in the book of John, chapter 4, verses 5 through 42. John is the only one who uh, gives us much insight unto his journey back and what took place there. And this discussion here in John 4, uh, verses 5 through 42, plants the seed for uh, Philip's going down to Samaria in Acts 8. In Acts 8, Philip goes down to Samaria under the persecution of Saul of Tarsus. He goes down to Samaria and there he preaches to them Jesus, uh, which they already knew of. He preaches to them about his death, his burial, his resurrection, uh, the opportunity for the forgiveness of sins to be a part of the the kingdom, the church. And when they believe Philip's preaching concerning the kingdom and Jesus, we're told that they were baptized. Now, if you don't connect the dots, it just again looks like Philip was one of the ones just ran off and he went down to Samaria and he had a lot of success. But a lot of the success that Philip had in Samaria is based upon what happens here in John 4, verses 5 through 42. And so um, just by way of, of an introduction, we'll spend more time on it next week, but um, he chose to go back this way. He could have went another way, but he didn't. Um, did he come down that way? I don't know. I would say that if he's going back that way, he didn't have a problem coming down that way, but uh, and he goes uh, to a city of Samaria uh, in the area of the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. Uh, Jacob's well had been something. Wells were very important uh, in and still are in the Holy Land. Uh, the, the rain you know, great pools and ponds of water, uh, just not there. And so uh, wells were an extremely important to keeping the livestock uh, alive, uh, to take care of the needs of the communities and areas. Many times there were oases established around where a well was so that those who were traveling uh, could have a place that they could know that there would be water and some provisions. Cities sprang up around uh, these uh, oases uh, as people uh, were able to use the water and things which were there. So this well was dug by Jacob uh, a very long time ago. Uh, and this was in the area of land which he uh, ultimately gave to his son Joseph. And so uh, when Jesus comes to this area, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting because as we said, if you're going to travel, uh, you're going to uh, know where you can stop, know where you can get some food, know where you can get some water, know where you can rest. You know, you're not very smart if you just take off wandering out there in the middle of nowhere where there's no water. And, uh, you know, again, you have a heat stroke, sunstroke, uh, you know, dehydrate, all of this. So uh, Jesus is doing like any other traveler would, and that is he comes uh, along in his journey to where he knows that there is water and that he can get something to drink and him and his disciples can find something uh, to eat. And, uh, you know, we're told that Jesus being wearied with his journey sat thus by the well. 
the trip from Jerusalem to uh, Galilee, as we said, it's a three-day journey, but that's a hike. Uh, this this isn't just meandering around. I mean, that's when you walk, you walk. And I don't know how many miles per day they would walk, but you know, if you're making a trip from Jerusalem up into Galilee, and you're going to do that in three or four days versus seven days, then you're going to be moving along. Uh, and so one of the things that John tells us is that he was wearied with his journey. He was tired. Uh, a lot of those journeys perhaps even started at night uh, to take advantage of the fact that uh, it was cooler, that there wasn't the heat of the sun, and so you could uh, travel along. Uh, it doesn't really give us a lot of detail as to how they were journeying, but he did, it says, being weary, tired from his journey, uh, sit down on the well, and John said it was about the sixth hour. Now, this is 12 o'clock if we're talking about um, the Jewish way of keeping track of time. If we're talking about the Roman way of keeping track of time, then it could be 6 o'clock in the morning, uh, or again, it could be 6 o'clock in the evening. And so, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, so we really don't know. It's, it, it's usually except the fact it was probably at noon. It was probably uh, the sixth hour by the reckoning of the Jewish people. And so they, uh, it would have been about noon. The sun would have been up. If they had been journeying for a while, uh, the, the high sun of noon uh, would be a reason to be wearied. Uh, and so Jesus uh, is sitting there, uh, and as we come into uh, verse 7, and we're going to stop there tonight, we'll pick up there next week. But there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Uh, and uh, as was the custom and as was the need. And so Jesus uses that opportunity uh, to speak with her. And this is a time of day that many people would probably have been coming and going uh, from the well had they spent a great deal of time there. Uh, and so we'll, we'll go into more detail of that next week. Does anybody have any Questions or comments? You know, I noticed earlier uh, as we talked last week about the kids did baptize. And there they said he wasn't baptized. Is it just that area he wasn't baptized? Well, he himself did not baptize, but his disciples. And he was baptizing, he was preaching baptism, but he didn't do the immersing himself. His disciples did. He didn't do the baptizing. He, he, yeah, I mean, he was preaching and teaching baptism, but he wasn't doing the immersing himself. He wasn't going to the water with him. Right. It's not that he wasn't preaching baptism, it's just that he wasn't uh, doing the baptism. And that happens a lot today. A lot of times in gospel meetings, the preacher who is holding the gospel meeting uh, will not uh, respond to anyone who comes forward. They'll leave that to the elder or the preacher there at the congregation. And so even though uh, the gospel was proclaimed by the evangelist or one doing the meeting, they won't necessarily do the baptism because they want someone from the local congregation to take care of that because they know the people better and, and they know uh, again, how to uh, you know, best deal with that. Baptism—it just the preacher or the, or the minister, you know, can do the baptism. Uh, the deacon and them can't, can they? Yeah, any anybody can do a baptism. I mean, it's not something that. Again, it's not about the one doing it; it's about the one receiving it. 
Uh, and so again, it's, you know, Jesus could have baptized, but I, as we've said before, I think the reason he didn't was, you know, what would have happened in the early church. There's lots of divisions, and Corinthians uh, divided up. Some said they were of Cephas, some said they were of Paul, some said they were of Jesus. You know, if Jesus baptized you and he didn't baptize me, uh, if push come to shove, you might think that you're more important than I am because Jesus baptized you. And so I think he didn't baptize, not because he didn't preach it, but he did not want. And that's what Paul, if you notice what Paul tells the church at Corinth, he was glad that he didn't baptize very many of them. Well, that doesn't mean that they weren't baptized. He just said, I'm glad that I didn't baptize very many of you because some of you would be saying that, you know, I baptized in my own name rather than in Jesus' name. And so it's apparent that Paul in some ways was like Jesus. He, he preached the gospel, but he left the baptism, the actual going down in the water with somebody and, and immersing them uh, to somebody else so that, uh, again, there wasn't people saying Paul was just trying to, to make disciples for himself. And even today we have some people who believe that, that Paul somehow changed the gospel of Christ and he made a Gentile church versus the uh, Jewish church, and we get into all of that, that he made disciples of his own and he changed the way the church was intended to be. And so there's a big hoopla and argument about that too. All right, thank you for your attention and comments. Lord willing, we'll pick up with the situation there at Samaria next Wednesday evening. In closing this evening, we wish to thank you again for spending your time and study with us. We hope the lesson has been uplifting and motivational. We encourage you to return again for our next lesson. Until then, may we invite you to visit our website you will find many study opportunities. Our resource page has links to the Gospel Broadcasting Network, a 24-7 station with many great Christian programs and speakers. In Search of the Lord's Way, with Brother Phil Sanders. We have two links for Bibles and downloadable software. If you are looking to really expand your knowledge, perhaps you might like to try World Video Bible School, a college-level learning site free of charge. So, until next time, may God bless and keep you in His care as we walk together in His truth. And remember as always, the Churches of Christ salute you.